pumps in the real world setting. And this will be followed by uh, the session for uh, Dr. Patil, where he'll be speaking on why study results mislead. The lecture of Dr. Patil was due to happen earlier, but he couldn't take the class because of some unavoidable circumstances. So he has agreed to take it today. Uh, and the Professor Booth has already joined us. Uh, we are extremely uh, honored to host him. And first and foremost, I must say that, sir, we are really sorry. It's such an awkward time in Canada, but still you agreed to participate. So thanks a lot. So Professor Booth is a professor uh, in the Department of Medical Oncology and Epidemiology at Queen's University at Kingston, Ontario. Uh, professor Booth, uh, please you can start now. Good morning, um, everyone. Thank you, Cyan, for that kind introduction and for the invitation to participate in the session today. Um, it's, uh, it's Saturday morning here, but it's not too early. So uh, I, have, I have four children, so they make sure I get up early anyhow. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to join you today. Um, Cyan, before I get started, can you just give me an idea of the, uh, the audience? Is this uh, generally radiation oncology consultants, trainees? Uh, is it a mix of both trainees and junior consultants? Or? So it's a mix of uh, both trainees as well as senior consultants but mostly Great. radiation oncologists. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna uh, get started here, I'll share my screen. Great, so as Cyan mentioned, I'm a uh, medical oncologist uh, based at Queen's University in Canada. And <clears throat> uh, so I spend about half of my time looking after patients at the cancer center, uh, predominantly uh, patients with GI cancer. But the other half of my time, I run a research program in, in health services research, or what sometimes is referred to as implementation research. And I had uh, the opportunity about five years ago, actually, to live in India. My family and I moved to Trivandrum, where I was a visiting scientist at uh, RCC Trivandrum, working with the group of uh, uh, clinical oncologists, uh, epidemiologists, and biostatisticians to build a collaborative program in uh, implementation research. And that's actually become a very important part of my career to me, a very special part. So I continue to work very closely with colleagues um, throughout India, predominantly uh, in Canada at RCC Trivandrum. I also work very closely with Dr. Raj Gopal and colleagues at Pallium India. And then I've had the privilege of working with Dr. Pramesh and colleagues at the Tata Memorial Hospital. And of course, a very wide network of uh, colleagues and friends through the National Cancer Grid. Um, and so uh, I certainly have many friends and, uh, and, and strong partnerships with colleagues in India. So it's a distinct pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Um, I have no relationships uh, with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so as Cyan mentioned, uh, what I thought I would speak about today is the concept of real world data or observational data. And I mentioned this as an important part of critical appraisal because I believe you're going to see an increasing number of publications that use observational data. And there are many things that we can do with what we call real world data that are, are very useful and can help advance cancer care. But there are some uses of real world data that we have to be very careful of. And so I thought I would speak about that today because I think these are studies that you're going to read in the literature. I also think it's studies that are very well suited to answer important questions um, of uh, quality of care and delivery of care in the Indian context and more broadly throughout uh, the global setting. So some of the key messages uh, is, first, there, there's a crisis in value of cancer care, and this is a crisis that um, is not, uh, uh, it, it's a global crisis in the value of cancer care. It's not just um, a crisis in countries with low uh, incomes. It's a, country, a crisis uh, where I live in Canada, in all countries, regardless of economic background. We're gonna talk about the concept of real world data and how we can use it to gain uh, important insights into access to care, quality of care and outcomes in routine practice. I'm gonna talk about how I think randomized trials and real world data should both be partners in the evolution of medical evidence. And then we're gonna close with some cautionary tales about some of the methodologic pitfalls 
that we can fall into if we use real world data to look at effectiveness. And so one of the key messages is that I strongly feel that real world data should not replace the randomized controlled trial. And we'll speak about that towards the end of the lecture. So this is a paper that we published over a decade ago. I did my training in Toronto at Princess Margaret Hospital under the mentorship of Dr. Ian Tannock. Um, who many of you may know because uh, Ian and I both have the privilege of uh, being faculty at the Credo Methods uh, Workshop every year in La Nabla. Um, and so this was a study where we looked at uh, the evolution of the randomized trial over 30 years. And we found that while the magnitude of benefit of new drugs remained stable, so the hazard ratio effect size was fairly stable over time, we found that clinical trials were becoming larger and larger. And because of that increased power and sample size, they were more likely to have a statistically significant result, which, which is uh, meeting the p-value threshold of 0.05. We also found that modern authors were increasingly likely to call their trial positive and to a, a, adopt treatments that had smaller benefits than might have been adopted 5, 10, or 20 years ago. And we also found that there was a major shift towards surrogate endpoints. And what I mean by surrogate endpoints are endpoints that are putative surrogates for what really matters to patients, which is overall survival and quality of life. This is a follow-up paper uh, we published a few years later that showed a couple very key trends in randomized trials. And I, I'm highlighting this because I think this actually is in some ways responsible for some of the crisis we have in the value of cancer care. You can see over, over time, um, almost a parallel rise in the proportion of trials that are funded by the pharmaceutical industry. It's now approaching 80% of all clinical trials funded by industry. Um, and you can see there's a massive increase in the sample size. And so while there are some benefits to increasing sample size to ensure adequate power, the problem with having these mega trials is that you now have statistical power to detect very, very small benefits. And this leads to an inherent tension between statistical significance and clinical significance. This is a very important paper um, published by Tito Fojo um, from Columbia University of New York City, formerly at the FDA. And it just gives an idea of some of the magnitude of benefits of our new therapies. And so this was all FDA approved drugs for solid cancer over a period of a decade. And uh, so these were approved drugs. So drugs that were deemed important enough that they became standard of care in the United States. And as you can see uh, in the palliative context, the median improvement in survival was two months. And so this is obviously within this group of drugs, there were some drugs that had important and large benefits, but you can see here, uh, the median gain is very, very modest. And as you well know, the cost of these drugs is astronomical and beyond the reach of most healthcare systems, including ours in Canada. This is a paper um, we wrote uh, now almost a decade ago. I wrote with one of my mentors, Dr. Elizabeth Eisenhower, where we talk about um, the concept of progression-free survival, which has now become the most common primary endpoint for studies in medical oncology. And while progression-free survival can occasionally be used as a useful surrogate, it needs to be validated as a statistically valid surrogate for overall survival. There's a handful of clinical context in which this is true, but the vast majority of time when we use progression-free survival, it really has very little relationship to overall survival. And in many ways, we might be misleading ourselves and misleading our patients that these treatments actually improve things that matter to patients. This is a, a, prov a very provocative slide, but I think uh, you know now almost a famous slide from Dr. Tannock, where he, um, he asks uh, in almost a, a rhetorical way, what should we call an agent that increases progression-free survival, has no effect on survival, and adds toxicity? I would argue that many of the treatments we read about every week in the Journal of Clinical Oncology or JAMA Oncology or the major cancer journals, I would argue that many of the new treatments fit this bill. So what do we call an agent that increases PFS, has no impact on survival and adds toxicity. And Dr. Tannock would argue, and I would support this argument, that in general, we should call these treatments harmful. We should not be calling these treatments standard of care. This is some work um, I did with colleagues uh, here in Canada, as well as from RCC Trivandrum during my sabbatical. And what we used was the ESMO magnitude of clinical benefits scale, um, which is a new tool to measure the value or the benefit of new treatments. And we applied that scale 
to all randomized trials of uh, systemic therapy in breast, lung, colorectal, and pancreas cancer over a period of several years. We found about 300 randomized trials. Uh, about half of these were quote unquote positive, meaning that they met their primary endpoint with a statistically significant difference in favor of the experimental arm. But when we applied the ESMO scale to these quote unquote positive trials, we found that only one third of them actually met the ESMO threshold for clinically meaningful benefit. And what that translates to is it means that only 15%, 1-5% of all clinical trials are identifying treatments that actually offer reasonable benefits for patients. So we have a very inefficient research system whereby we run a lot of very expensive large clinical trials and in only a small fraction do we identify treatments that have major benefits for our patients. This is a follow-up piece uh, that we published uh, the next year in Lancet Oncology. And um, this was actually important because we asked the question whether there was a relationship between the magnitude of benefit of a new cancer therapy and the drug cost. In most things that we're used to in our regular life, if you spend more money, you'll have a nicer car. If you spend more money, you'll have a nicer meal at a restaurant, et cetera. And what we found is that uh, standard relationship from most economic contexts does not apply to cancer medicines. If anything, there's actually an inverse relationship. We see that the drugs with the smallest benefit have the largest cost. And so this just speaks to the fact that the drug pricing ecosystem is completely broken and really needs to be overhauled. So just to kind of close the first uh, section where we're talking about what I call a crisis in the value of cancer care, um, we conceptualize healthcare value as uh, the healthcare outcomes uh, divided by the cost of the intervention. And so I, as clinically, I think of this as, you know, the magnitude of benefit. How much does this new treatment benefit my patients? And what is the cost, uh, the, the drug cost, but also side effects and quality of life cost? And so when you're reading the literature, especially new clinical trials of new systemic therapy or radi radiation therapy innovations that often have large price tags, I would encourage you to consider a number of things when you think about the value of the new treatment. So the first question is, what is the endpoint? Is it an endpoint that um, measures overall survival and quality of life, which I would argue are the two endpoints that matter to patients? Or is it a surrogate endpoint? If it's a surrogate endpoint, has it been shown to be a valid, statistically valid surrogate endpoint for OS? The second question is, even if you're using a good endpoint, what is the effect size? Is it improving overall survival by four months, six months, or a year? Or is it improving overall survival by four weeks? And then finally, do these endpoints and does this magnitude of benefit matter to patients? And so I think we need to go back to the basics in our field in oncology, and this applies to both medical oncology as well as radiation oncology, where there's a number of new, expensive, innovative ways of delivering radiotherapy that are coming out. I think we have to come back to the basics and say, what are we achieving? And certainly there are new technologies that have huge benefits for our patients, but in many cases, some of the new innovations have very low value and perhaps can divert resources from where they could be used for greater good. We're now gonna shift um, gears to talk a little bit about real world data. And so this is getting to um, some of the studies that you're gonna see increasingly in the literature, which is using observational data or population-based data. So there's a lot that we can do with what we call population-based studies. We can look to see whether physicians change practice and we can describe what we call the evidence to practice gap. We can look to see whether there are uh, gaps in the quality of care. Are patients getting treatment as it was given in the clinical trial? We can measure whether the benefits and toxicities of therapy in the real world are as we would expect based on clinical trials. That's related to what we call the efficacy to effectiveness gap. And then we can measure outcomes and care for all the millions of patients worldwide who would never be eligible for a randomized trial. I'm sure that you can think of your own clinics in India, and I can certainly think of my own clinic in Kingston, and the vast majority of patients we look after every day would not have been eligible for the clinical trial, and real-world data can help inform what their care and outcomes looks like in routine practice. This is a paper that Dr. Tanik and I wrote to now about six years ago, where we outline um, both the strengths of randomized trials and the limitations of randomized trials, and we uh, contrast that with population-based studies. And we actually see these not as competing forms of medical evidence, but as partners in what we call the evolution of medical evidence. And so the randomized controlled trial, obviously, uh, you know, on, on, this, on the basis of the simple act of randomization, 
presents the best measure of efficacy. So efficacy is the extent to which a new treatment works under ideal conditions. And because of randomization, the two treatment groups are otherwise identical. And the only difference in the patients is the treatment they're given and therefore any difference in outcome can be ascribed to that intervention. The problem is, so this internal validity is very high. The problem is the external validity. How these results apply to our patients in routine practice can be very limited. Population-based studies, on the other hand, while they have less robust internal validity, they can give us an idea of care, quality, and outcomes in the real world, and we would never get that information from randomized trials. So in the ideal system, we would have a randomized trial to describe efficacy of a new treatment, and that would be followed up by a population-based study to see whether patients are getting good care, what the outcomes are, and whether the new treatment actually works in the real world. So this is an overview, uh, a very th uh, thick and detailed overview, but uh, you might find it useful where we describe um, real world data, what it is and how it can be used as we try to move towards achieving the achievable in cancer care. So this is a busy slide and the details you can review later. I'm happy to make these slides available through Dr. Cyan. But in general, real world data can tell us about patients, about treatment and about outcomes. So for patients, it can tell us about where the patients are in the world, what their demographics are, what their symptom burden is. For treatments, we can learn about access to care and quality of care. So for example, we can describe underutilization of treatment and overutilization. We can look at wait times and referral patterns. We can look at the quality of care. Is care being delivered as it is recommended in guidelines or clinical trials? And then we can look at outcomes for rare diseases and rare patients for which we would never have enough patients for a clinical trial. We can do what we call an outcomes reality check, where we compare the outcomes in our own practice to the outcomes of a clinical trial and try to understand how we can close those gaps. We can look about survivorship, economics, and then we can do comparative effectiveness research. And I'll speak about that in a few minutes. So I'm going to go through uh, a series of examples of observational studies using real world data that measure these things, access to care, quality of care, and outcomes. And some of this work is from my program in Canada, and some of this work is from um, studies that we've done in the Indian context. Before we move to that, just to give you an idea of where do we get real world data, so this is a very busy slide with a lot of acronyms. The details aren't really important, um, but the concept here is that Clinical trials have very precise, clean data, and they're very rarely missing information on anything. Real world data, on the other hand, can be very messy. We start with what we have the Ontario Cancer Registry, which collects uh, information on every patient with cancer in the province of Ontario, which has a population of 14 million people. We have records from all the hospitals in Ontario about surgery and admissions to hospital. We have all the radiotherapy and chemotherapy records in Ontario and we can get information about socioeconomic status from um, the Canadian census. So this is um, a study we did about 10 years ago where we asked the question in Ontario where there is a universal uh, healthcare system. So there's only one healthcare system in Ontario, a public system. Uh, pr private cancer care actually is, is illegal in Ontario. Um, we asked the question in the context of a universal healthcare system, is there a difference in cancer survival across socioeconomic groups? And if so, is that driven by differences in stage of cancer at diagnosis? And so we use the data sets I showed in an earlier slide uh, from the Ontario Cancer Registry to identify all new cancer cases. And we looked at socioeconomic status based on the income of the neighborhood where patients lived. And as you can see here, we found important um, statistically significant and clinically meaningful differences. So SES1, represents patients from the poorest neighborhoods in Ontario. SES5 represents patients from the most affluent neighborhoods. And you can see here for both breast cancer and colon cancer, a clear gradient, not just a difference between poorest and most affluent, but a dose response as you move up the SES profile for both breast cancer and colon cancer. And these are significant differences. Um, Obviously this is overall survival. So a lot of this difference might be driven by nutrition, obesity, smoking, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. 
But when we look at cancer specific survival, we see a similar phenomenon. We see important differences in cancer survival for both breast cancer and colon cancer. And these differences are large enough that if we had an expensive monoclonal antibody or a new way of delivering radiotherapy with this difference, it would be a major paper in our journals and presented as plenary sessions at the major international meetings. So these are important differences. However, when we looked at what's driving this difference in outcome, we found that in the Canadian context, it does not appear to be driven largely by stage. So you can see here, the purple bar is patients from the most affluent communities. And here the violet bar is patients from the poorest communities. You can see there is a small difference. Patients from the most affluent neighborhoods have slightly more stage one disease and slightly less stage four disease. But these are small differences that do not explain everything we see with survival. So there remains perhaps differences in other comorbidities, perhaps cancer biology, and perhaps access to care, which is leading to this difference even in a high income country with a universal healthcare system. So this takes me um, to my home in India. So uh, this is where I lived and worked in 2016 in Trivandrum at uh, the Regional Cancer Center. Um, and this is uh, our family where we spent lots of time enjoying uh, Kerala traveling around and making lots of uh, uh, lots of new friends and memories for a lifetime. This is my home base at RCC Trivandrum. Dr. Ali Emma Matthew, professor and head of epidemiology and biostatistics. Uh, they run an excellent hospital-based and population-based cancer registry. So I would spend the mornings uh, in the OP uh, with my clinical colleagues and the afternoons I would spend in the research unit so I could learn from my colleagues about delivery of cancer care in the Indian context, as well as um, the important research that Dr. Matthew and colleagues were doing. And so this is kind of a network of, uh, of our partnerships with uh, very close relationships and ongoing partners with Pallium India, the National Cancer Grid, TMH, RCC, and actually I've developed relationships and projects with uh, many other centers across the Indian context. So this is, um, missing a slide here, but anyhow, one of the first studies that Dr. Matthew wanted to do was she was interested in replicating the socioeconomic status study we did at Canada in the Indian context. And so what we did was, um, and this paper was published in the Journal of Global Oncology two years ago, we used the population-based cancer registry of Trivandrum district, identifying all women with breast cancer and cervical cancer and all men with oral cavity and lung cancer. So we chose the most common cancers. We did not have um, accurate information about household income. And so we used their education level as a surrogate for socioeconomic status. And as you can see here, there was a clear gradient in stage of cancer at diagnosis. You can see here for breast cancer, women with the lowest educational level were far more likely to be diagnosed with very advanced or incurable breast cancer compared to women with higher levels of education. And we saw the same phenomenon for cervix cancer and oral cavity cancer. And so this was quite a striking difference and it probably is not surprising to those of you who work every day in the Indian context. And so this speaks to the importance of trying to facilitate early diagnosis for patients in the Indian cancer system, where getting them into the cancer care centers earlier when they have curable disease is probably going to lead to the largest public health benefit in the Indian context. We did a follow-up paper, which was published in the Journal of Global Oncology just last year, which showed that there are survival differences across education levels in Kerala, and that unlike Canada, a lot of this difference in survival is driven by differences in the stage of cancer diagnosis. Um, this is a paper I did with uh, Dr. Raj Gopal and colleagues uh, at Pallium India, where we looked at utilization of morphine in Kerala. And as I'm sure you are well aware, there are two opioid epidemics in the world. Um, I live in Canada where there's one epidemic, which is marked overutilization of opioids for non-cancer pain. But most of the world, including India, lives in the other epidemic, which is marked underutilization of, and lack of access to pain control and palliative care. Of course, Dr. Raj Gopal and Pallium India and other partners in India are world leaders in the global palliative care movement. And this is a graphical depiction showing marked overutilization. This is the use per capita of opioids in Canada, the US and Australia and marked underutilization in many parts of South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> 
So through uh, Raj uh, and his colleagues, we had access to Kerala's uh, government for uh, data for opioid utilization. We described temporal trends and uh, practice patterns across Kerala. And we saw that the opioid utilization rate was increasing, um, uh, but you can see the current rate was one and a half milligrams per capita per year. And this is uh, much higher than the rest of India. And so Kerala is, is, is doing better than many contexts in India. But as Raj would say, this is not to let them sit on their laurels. Uh, he said, there's still a lot of work to do because the optimal utilization of opioids, uh, while the number is not known, um, it's probably in the range of 50 or perhaps 100 or 200 milligrams per person per capita. So there's still a long way to go to ensure access to opioids and palliative care in Kerala and across India. We also saw wide variation based on where you lived in Kerala. And so this has direct policy relevance. Um, we're now going to shift from access to care uh, to quality of care. And I have some examples from both Ontario as well as uh, Kerala. So this comes from our bladder cancer research program. Um, very briefly, I'm sure many of you uh, are, are aware of this, but for those of you who don't treat bladder cancer, initial local therapies for muscle invasive disease include either cystectomy or radical radiotherapy. I was taught in training from um, textbooks and surgical series that about 50% of patients are cured. Guidelines recommend uh, the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but there's less evidence to support the use of adjuvant chemotherapy. So that was the existing knowledge. And we use real world data and observational design to understand practice patterns and outcome in Ontario. So we linked the various data sets I showed you earlier. We identified about 8,000 patients with bladder cancer, about 5,000 had cystectomy, 3,000 had uh, radical radiotherapy. And you can see here over time, there's um, in North America, we tend to perform a lot of cystectomy and you can see the rate of cancer is going up, but as a proportion, the use of radiotherapy is going down. Radiotherapy cases in the Canadian context, patients tend to be older and have greater comorbidity. These are the survival curves and there's two important points here from these observational data. The first is that, as I told you earlier, we were taught in training that five-year survival should be around 50%. You can see here in Ontario, it's about 35%. So there's a big gap between outcomes in the real world and outcomes from clinical trials. And this is not just an Ontario problem. There's similar data from the UK and Northern Europe. The other important finding is that while there has not been a randomized trial of radiotherapy and surgery, you can see that when you adjust for um, uh, age and comorbidity, there's uh, you know, perhaps very little difference in outcome between RT and surgery. It looks like, does Dr. Redmi have a question? I'm happy to pause. I just see a hand raised by Dr. Redmi if you have a question. Otherwise we can, oh, there we go. Uh, I think we'll take the questions at the end. You can go okay. on. Okay, sure, okay, happy to do that. Um, this is something else you can do with observational data that you can't do with clinical trials. You can look at what we call the volume outcomes hypothesis, which is that the volumes of outcomes are largely driven, um, sorry, the outcomes are associated with the volumes of care. So we looked at the hospital volume of cystectomy and the surgeon volume. These are the lowest volume providers and the highest volume providers. And the first thing you can see is that in Ontario, about half of cystectomy was being done by a surgeon that only does one or two cases per year. You know, I'm not a surgeon, but this is very low volume for what is a huge complicated operation. And you can see here, if you look for both hospital volume and surgeon volume, you see a clear gradient with decreasing post-operative mortality with greater volume and improved long-term cancer survival for both hospital volume and surgeon volume. So this has led to a reorganization of the way we deliver bladder cancer care in Ontario to ensure that patients are treated at high volume centers. And this is uh, the final slide from our bladder cancer study where we showed that despite guidelines, practice in Ontario was very discordant with uh, clinical evidence. So you can see here the blue bars represent the proportion of patients who get neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And that's what's recommended from guidelines. You can see for many years, it was about 5%. Conversely, about one third of patients were getting adjuvant chemotherapy. And so we looked at this and started writing about it and working with our colleagues. And you can see that finally, after several years later, there's been an increase so that now many more patients are getting neoadjuvant therapy. Um, and so about half, about 50 or 60% of patients in the province are getting some form 
of perioperative chemotherapy. And we've actually seen over time that outcomes are beginning to improve. Um, this is a quality of care study led by my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar um, in Kochi, as many of you know, a surgical oncologist. Um, and so he was interested in using the National Cancer Grid's uh, guidelines for the Indian context and applying those to his own practice. So using um, data from his own teaching hospital, Amrita and Kochi, we looked at concordance in his practice with six elements of breast cancer care. This was a retrospective study of all women who had curative intent surgery for breast cancer, about 400 patients. And it, this was published in the Journal of Global Oncology last year. And so we chose a number of domains from the NCG guidelines, surgical domains, chemotherapy domains, radiotherapy and testing. And what we found is that the concordance was actually pretty high um, for those domains of care, which were affordable. And you can see here that the domains of care with, um, for which there's large expense associated with treatment had lower concordance. And so this gave an idea of potentially areas for improvement. It also highlights the importance of financial toxicity. And this has led Dr. Vijay Kumar and colleagues to develop a multi-center study through the National Cancer Grid to begin to dis describe quality and concordance of care for breast cancer and other cancers in an effort to improve things. And this is something we've done for many years in Ontario. It's meant as a reflective exercise, not any kind of you know, shaming exercise. All of us have elements of our care that we can improve. We would never expect 100% concordance for a variety of reasons, but certainly when we've done this work in Ontario, we've identified system level areas that can be improved that have led to better patient care and outcomes. And Dr. Vijay Kumar and colleagues are keen to move forward with this in the Indian context. The last example from quality of care that I'd like to speak about, this also comes from the Indian context, and this is uh, the Choosing Wisely um, program that was led by my friend and colleague, Dr. Pramesh. And so as I, I describe this as the overutilization paradox. And so as many of you know, uh, in the Indian setting, underutilization and lack of access to care is the primary problem for most patients uh, in the Indian cancer system. Um, however, there's a parallel epidemic, um, largely in the urban centers and uh, often in the private sector of what we call overutilization. So this is use of treatments, interventions, and tests that may have little benefit for the patients. We see this commonly in the West um, and many high income countries have used a choosing wisely program which is an evidence-based way to rank and to identify 10 common practices that should be avoided in routine care. And so I was involved in Choosing Wisely Canada, where we went through this process. And this has largely been done by different specialties across Canada, the US and the UK. And we proposed this to our colleagues at the National Cancer Grid, and um, they jumped on it. We had a wonderful team, a very dynamic, multidisciplinary team of stakeholders from both clinical medicine, as well as patient representative groups from the public and private sectors. Um, some of us were involved to provide methodologic support, and we had engagement and endorsement from the four major oncology societies in India. And the idea here was to identify common practices that should be avoided in India's cancer system. And this was published in the Lancet Oncology and actually generated a lot of excitement globally because it was the first time choosing wisely in any specialty had ever been done outside of a high income country. And it shows that this concept is relevant in all cancer systems globally. And so these are some of the items that we identified. Um, some of them were uh, borrowed or replicated from Choosing Wisely Canada or Choosing Wisely ASCO. And some of them were unique homegrown um, Indian additions to the list. For example, do not delay or avoid palliative care for a patient just because they are pursuing disease-directed treatment. Um, avoid chemotherapy with patients who have poor performance status who are unlikely to benefit. Uh, this was a, a, a unique uh, Indian addition to the list, which is do not order PET scans to monitor response to palliative chemotherapy for solid tumors. Another one from the Indian context, do not decide treatment for potentially curable cancers without input from a multidisciplinary team. Uh, this one also came, uh, was a unique uh, new addition from India. Do not treat patients with advanced metastatic cancer in the intensive care unit unless there's acutely reversible event. Um, actually, these are relevant here for our radiation oncology audience. Do not use advanced radiotherapy techniques when conventional techniques can be just as useful. And this was um, a suggestion not to initiate uh, whole breast radiotherapy in 25 fractions without considering 
shorter treatment schedules. And there was also a component of that for single fraction of palliative radiotherapy for bone metastases. And so now we're gonna shift briefly to outcomes before we close with a few comments on methodology. Um, we've talked about access, quality, and now outcomes of care that we can evaluate using real world or observational data. This was a study we did looking at utilization of adjuvant chemotherapy for non-small cell lung cancer. It was a population-based retrospective cohort study of all patients who underwent surgical resection uh, in Ontario. We linked the cancer registry and electronic records of treatment. Um, to identify practice patterns and care. Uh, the major paper came out showing the use of adjuvant chemotherapy in 2004. Um, and as you can see, there was uptake of chemotherapy, but still probably underutilized. Only about one third of patients were getting adjuvant chemotherapy. And when we looked here, we used uh, an ecologic, or sorry, a, uh, a, a instrument variable analysis to measure uh, benefit. And you can see here that over time, the outcomes of patients with lung cancer actually improve exactly to the extent one would have predicted based on use of chemotherapy from the clinical trial. So this actually showed we could safely give chemotherapy in the real world and that outcomes improved as we would expect from the clinical trials. This is an example of uh, measuring outcomes of testicular cancer. And so in this study, we look to see whether surveillance can be safely done in the real world. As you know, guideline recommendations for surveillance, they don't come from randomized trials, they come from high volume leading centers. And the question was, could you safely do surveillance for stage one testes cancer in the periphery and in, in routine practice? So we had two questions, is surveillance being adopted in routine practice and are the outcomes in routine practice as good as we think they are? And this showed, um, you can see here, particularly uh, for seminoma, you can see that there's been a marked uh, reduction in the use of radiotherapy and a marked increase in the proportion of patients who uh, undergo surveillance for stage one disease. So we see a huge de-escalation in treatment intensity for patients with stage one seminoma. The question was, did that come at a cost? Were outcomes compromised in the real world? And as you can see here, there's not many cancers that have survival curves that look like this. I can say that as someone who treats pancreas cancer. But you can see here for testes cancer, the outcomes in Ontario were excellent. And then when we track the outcomes over time, we can see that as surveillance was adopted, there was no detriment in survival. Um, in fact, it was maintained with excellent outcomes. So this was a real world data validation of outcomes and quality in the real world. So now I'm gonna speak just very briefly about um, some of the methodologic pitfalls with these real world data studies and observation. The examples I've given so far generally measure access and quality. And as long as you are careful to identify all of the cases, the methodologic pitfalls are, are fairly minimal or can be easily handled. The very tricky methodology and the studies which you have to be the most careful when interpreting are studies which do what we call comparative effectiveness. They use real world data to compare the outcome of treatment A versus treatment B. And that is a very, very difficult and in fact, potentially dangerous study design that you need to be careful of. And that's because of selection bias and residual confounding. Obviously the act of randomization takes care of almost all of this, but in the real world, there's a reason why one patient gets adjuvant chemotherapy and another patient does not. And you can only adjust for things that you know about and for variables that you can measure. There's often a lot of missing data with pathology, stage, performance status, smoking, comorbidity, et cetera, and you can't adjust for those things. There's also problems with misclassification bias and what we call immortal time bias. And these limitations, they actually don't really plague a lot of the studies I talked about where we're measuring guideline concordance, access, and quality, but they're very, very problematic in what we call comparative effectiveness research. And so I guess one of the key points is that there's a lot we can do with real world data that is not comparative effectiveness research. And these are the studies that people are starting to push. And there's, you know, people are saying, oh, we don't need randomized trials anymore. We can just use real world data. And I think that's very dangerous. And I'll give you some examples why. So these are a pair of um, commentaries that we wrote for the Journal of Clinical Oncology, where we actually highlighted some studies that used real world data from the United States 
as a way to say that a new treatment might have benefit. And in fact, I think they were actually dangerous. The first one was a study of real world data um, looking at patients with incurable bladder cancer who were on palliative chemotherapy and whether there was a role to do a radical cystectomy in these patients. As you can imagine, these patients have a life expectancy of between six and 12 months and doing a major operation with huge morbidity on them obviously has a huge impact on quality of life and time in hospital and time at home. And I won't get into the details here, you can read our commentary, but these investigators from a major institution in the United States made a series of methodologic mistakes in their analysis and they published a paper in the Journal of Clinical Oncology suggesting that radical cystectomy in these patients with incurable bladder cancer had a massive improvement in median survival. And you can imagine when most clinicians who read these studies and don't have the methodologic skills to understand them, and they read the study in a major journal, if they, they, they very well might start offering cystectomy to these patients when, when you go through the methods, there was a lot of mistakes which led to this erroneous finding. We also wrote about um, cautionary tales from real world data for both um, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy for colon cancer and radiotherapy for rectal cancer. So I'll speak briefly about the radiotherapy example just given the audience. Um, we know from randomized trials that radiotherapy is a very important part of rectal cancer treatment. It reduces local recurrence and relapse, but clinical trials really have not shown that radiotherapy itself is associated with improved overall survival. So some investigators in the United States used real world data to describe radiotherapy delivery in rectal cancer. And so that's reasonable. They looked to see how many patients were getting radiotherapy, why patients didn't get radiotherapy, and perhaps how many patients were unable to complete radiotherapy. So those are important questions from a quality of care point of view. But then they asked a question, if you completed radiotherapy, was your survival better than if you didn't complete radiotherapy? And so, as I mentioned earlier, we know from clinical trials that there probably is no overall survival benefit in this context from radiotherapy of any kind, let alone whether you got all the radiotherapy or incomplete radiotherapy. And again, what they found here, and they published this in JSA, and I think this, was, this one was in cancer, they published a paper showing a huge difference in overall survival if you completed radiotherapy for rectal cancer compared to if you didn't complete radiotherapy from rectal cancer. And so it didn't make sense based on what we know from clinical trials. And when you go through the methods, it was very clear that the patients who completed radiotherapy were younger, fitter, healthier, and we're going to have better outcomes regardless. And so again, this was an example of real world data with many methodologic pitfalls. And I just encourage you to be very skeptical when you read papers that use observational design to prove that one treatment is better than the other, especially if there's no randomized trial data to back up that. Um, I'll let you read, this is just a paragraph um, that summarizes some of these issues. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess maybe we'll just go through a couple sentences. Studies that compare outcomes between non-randomized groups of patients are fundamentally problematic because the patients may also differ with respect to other prognostic factors. This is just as true for modern population-based studies as it was for traditional case series from 50 years ago. Population-based studies may have greater external validity than institution-based studies, but there is no reason to believe they have any greater internal validity and both therefore are classified as level three evidence in Sackett's hierarchy. And this is a paper done by a group in the US where they used real world data to perform treatment comparisons and they compared that to what we know from randomized trials. And they found that it was a coin flip. They found that real world data only identified treatment benefits consistent with the randomized trial in about 40% of the time. And so this was a major problem. It just gives us kind of reason to pause and to think very carefully, but there's many ways to use real world data, but a comparison of one treatment to the other is probably not the best use of these data sets. So in closing, I think we've talked about there, there's a crisis in value of cancer care globally. We need to think about endpoints and magnitude of benefit. We've talked about how real world data, um, which could be used in any healthcare setting in Canada, the UK and in India and Sub-Saharan Africa can offer important insights to access and quality of care of our patients and outcomes. And if you identify problems, it allows the system to begin to improve care. I would argue that following randomized control trials, 
that show a new treatment or design intervention works, we should do real world data studies to follow up to see if patients are getting access to treatment and whether the outcomes are as we would expect. And finally, while real world data can offer some insight into the effectiveness of treatment, it cannot be used to replace randomized control trial. And just in closing, before we open up for questions, I have one final slide, which will, uh, uh, I show this whenever I travel to India. This will reinforce every stereotype you have about Canada. It's a photo of a Canadian boy in a canoe amongst the icebergs paddling on his way to school. And so thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. I'm happy to open this up now uh, for questions. Thanks a lot, Professor Booth. That was, uh, I mean, a very, very important session uh, with lots of insights uh, with regards to real world data. Uh, and I think what was really uh, amazing was almost a 45 minutes session where you spoke, I mean, you had so much publication that you could show your own research alone. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, now I think it's time for questions. Uh, can you access the chat box, Professor? Yeah, thanks. There's yeah, some excellent questions here. Thank you. Um, so why I'll go through the questions in the chat box and then people certainly can um, ask uh, questions as we go through. Okay, so here's one question. Uh, even if there is no overall survive, survival benefit, if a drug has PFS benefit and the quality of life is well preserved, what is the harm in offering the drug, especially in aggressive malignancies? So it's a good question. Um, I don't think we always need overall survival benefit, but I think we need to see that quality of life ideally improves or is maintained. And I think that if you see, if you measure quality of life and you show that it's improving, um, or even if it's maintained and the other arm is decreased, that's not unreasonable, but I would say you don't really need to measure PFS for that. Um, it's been shown, my, my friend and colleague here at Queens, um, Bishal Gawali, um, has shown in uh, a very nice analysis that there is no relationship between PFS and quality of life. And so what I would argue is that because people often say, oh, well, there's a PFS benefit, so patients must feel better. And I would argue, well, actually don't measure PFS, measure quality of life. And if quality of life is improved or, or, or better in, in the experimental arm, that in itself might be a good enough reason to use that treatment. So I don't think we need PFS to measure quality of life. That, that's an excellent question. Um, next question, when real world data is collected, wouldn't there be significant amounts of bias um, with reference to SES? Couldn't it be that rich people afford a more expensive staging with eyes? You're absolutely right. So, so it, it, it's, it's those differences in, in treatment seeking that we're actually trying to identify. So you can, the real world data allows you to ask or answer the question, do rich patients have better outcomes from cancer? Okay, and so we can answer that yes. The next thing is to try to figure out why that might be. And so again, you can use real world data to measure, well, are they more likely to have screening? Are they more likely to have uh, expensive testing modalities? Are they more likely to have different biology? Are they more likely to have different treatments? So I wouldn't say that that's necessarily a form of bias. I would say that it's um, confounders uh, that actually can explain the observed uh, effect. So that's actually a, a great point. Um, next, would it be right to say population-based studies is limited to epidemiologic studies? Can you cite a few landmark papers? So I think we got into that clinical research. So some of the examples I've given at the end, and I'm happy to share my slides. We can look up the examples, the clinical examples, bladder cancer, lung cancer, testes cancer. And then the ones that I think are worth reading are, uh, you can read the primary papers or just read our commentaries in the Journal of Clinical Oncology where we dissect the um, bladder cancer cystectomy and the rectal cancer radiotherapy trials and give an example of where these methodologic pitfalls exist. Um, question here, I have developed over the course of RADOM training, how do we decide how many weeks of survival is significant for patient and family? This is a really, really good point. So what constitutes a meaningful improvement in survival? This is obviously a deeply philosophical question and it's gonna vary based on the perspective. You can imagine that healthcare system leaders will have one perspective. The people who pay for treatment might have one perspective. Patients and their families will have a perspective, doctors, nurses, and it's gonna differ across the world and it's gonna differ between patients. And so there's no single answer for this. 
the ESMO framework generally set the threshold um, that for a palliative solid tumor, you need to have an overall survival benefit of at least a few months. And I sit on the essential medicines list working group at the World Health Organization. And actually one of my close colleagues on that committee is Dr. Manju Sengar from TMH. And we worked over the last few years for the WHO to say that for healthcare systems globally to pay for treatments and be sustainable, we would want to see for palliative solid tumors an improvement in overall survival of ideally at least four to six months. And that's not to trivialize and, you know, gains in one or two months might be important, but we have to take a step back here and think about the cost of these treatments for the system, the financial cost for the patient, but also the, the quality of life cost for the patient. If they only have three months left to live and they're going to be traveling 10 hours by train to an urban center in India, get treatment every week. I think we have to have honest discussions with our patients about the extent to which um, treatments matter. And there's going to be patients both in Canada and India and the UK, where if you tell them the treatment will improve their survival by one or two months, there's going to be some patients that will say, okay, I want treatment. There's actually going to be a lot of patients that will say, no, thank you, especially if they're having to sell their, their farm or go into debt to pay for that. Um, next question, in situations where there's no concordance between RCT and real world day was the next step. Good point. I mean, I think we start with the randomized trial. If it shows there's benefit, then I think we should do a real world data study. And if that confirms benefit, great. However, if the real world data study suggests that the benefit is very small or absent, I think then we need to, you know, it can come into our decision making with patients to say, well, and I do this with fulfirinox um, for pancreas cancer. So we have another publication where we looked at the utilization of fulfirinox for advanced pancreas cancer. And in the clinical trials, the median survival was 11 months. In Ontario, it was closer to eight months. And so I tell patients, this is a pretty toxic therapy that in clinical trials improves survival by about three months, but real world data suggests it's probably less than that. And, and then I let the patient make a decision. And some of my patients still take fulfirinox. Some of them might elect to have gemcitabine and nab paclitaxel um, as a cheaper alternative. Um, could you please share your email address? Yes, happy to do that. Um, Cy, what I'll do is I'll send uh, a copy of these slides uh, to Cyan and he can share it with the group and I'm happy to have you contact me. Um, quality of life is at times subjective and an objective parameter. Uh, it can be subjective, but there's validated instruments for quality of life. So I would suggest that it's um, just as important. And remember PFS, even though it feels precise because it's a measurement, there's a lot of variability about how you measure a tumor. There's a lot of variability about when you do the scan um, and how you interpret that scan. So it doesn't, it's not quite as precise as we might think. And what is your opinion on conducting pragmatic randomized trials? Yes, this, this is a huge issue. So again, most of these clinical trials historically, as I said, you had to be an almost an Olympian with cancer to get on the trial, right? These patients are younger, fitter, they're richer than average patients. They're often treated in these specialized units in Boston or Paris. And they might know that they might, the patients on those trials probably look nothing like the patients I see in my clinic in Kingston or that you see in your clinics in Kolkata or people see in routine practice in St. Louis. And so there's a movement towards a pragmatic design where we relax the eligibility criteria. So we enroll older patients and with more comorbidity. And we can also be pragmatic in how we design interventions so that they're not so complicated and that they can be more efficient. I think one of the things is that if you design a clinical trial to identify a larger magnitude of benefit, the sample size comes down. So these huge trials of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 patients, they consume a lot of resources and time and they detect, they have power to detect very small benefits. So if you actually power your trial to detect a larger benefit, the amazing thing is you don't need as many patients. You can do three research studies instead of one and answer three questions and help patients by identifying greater therapies um, that have larger benefits. Um, I think we have a, a few more minutes if there's any other questions. Dr. Sain, can we ask questions directly by uh, unmuting ourselves? Of course, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Professor Booth, for such an excellent uh, this lecture and discussion. I wish to ask a question regarding a follow-up uh, for a particular statement which you made. Now, in theory, I agree with you. I'm all there with you when you say that perhaps the for palliative situations, the quantum of benefit in at least in overall survival should be minimum three to six months. Uh, 
totally agree. My issue is, and I'm just playing the devil's advocate here, that in recent times, the last five years, I think there have been a lot of good articles which have now concluded that the physician measured called overall survival does not really correlate well with actual overall survival. What that means is physicians either usually mostly underestimate what the overall survival may be. Now, that may be because of multiple reasons. But then my question then is that once we have this reasonably established fact that physicians cannot really measure with it, they're going to survive, the patient is going to survive for three months or four months or six months. Does it make sense to actually have or what's your opinion on having these firm guidelines? If it's not three months, then we should not do something or not approve something. What, what, what do you yeah, mean, what great, do you great question. So I think there's a couple issues there. The first is you're right. Uh, physicians are terrible at prognosis. We're always wrong. Um, and so when I, and, and we have pretty open and honest discussions with patients about prognosis in, in, in my practice. And some of that has to do with the luxury we have in the West of, I might only see 15 patients or 20 patients in a day in the OP. And I know that many of you are seeing 50 or 60 or 80 patients. So I have the luxury of time to have these conversations that you don't because the volumes are just so much higher in India. So the first thing is to try to have these conversations um, to give them an idea, at least their cancer is not curable. And generally what I say, for example, a patient with advanced pancreas cancer, when I have the discussion, I, I tell them, I say, we're going to talk about prognosis and I'm going to give you some numbers, but I will say that doctors are always wrong. And I'll say, so these are just guidelines. And I, I'll say most patients with cancer of the pancreas, they live for months and not years. And when I say months, for some patients, it's only two or three months. Other patients, it could be six or eight months or perhaps 10 or 15 or 18 months. And I said, I'll give you updates as we go along. And then I say the clinical trials of fulfirinox showed that if you take fulfirinox compared to an older chemotherapy, your survival is improved by about three months. And so that's the conversation I have. And so even if my prognosis, if they're going to live five months versus two months versus nine months, even if my prognosis is is not correct and it probably is wrong, at least I'm going to offer a treatment that in the ideal circumstances of a clinical trial improves survival by three to six months. So I'm not saying that we only give treatments to patients that are going to live at least six months, although you could argue if they're going to live less than six months, we probably shouldn't be doing it. What, what we said the WHO is that in a clinical trial, there needs to be at least a three to six month improvement in overall survival for a treatment to really be considered essential. And you can, you can debate whether it's three months or two months or five months. And some of it, of course, depends on toxicity and cost, right? If we're talking about water or, or something that's only, you know, a thousand rupees, then perhaps, you know, we would accept a one month or two month survival benefit. But if we're talking about something that's, you know, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars, we're going to want to see a larger improvement because of the uh, the cost implications for the patient in the system. Um, so, so those were some important points. I hope that was a helpful answer to your question. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Both, uh, for the excellent presentation as well as uh, the subsequent discussions. And we had some interesting questions from the participants as well. So, thanks a lot. Great. Thank, thank you for hosting me. Uh, it was it was fun. I enjoyed it. And certainly I hope to uh, meet some of you in person on my next uh, trip back to India. So, so best wishes and good day. Yeah, we look forward to meeting you as well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh, so we now move forward to our uh, second session. That would be on why study results mislead. And for that, we have with us uh, Professor Vijay Patil. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Medical Oncology at Tata Memorial Hospital. Dr. Bartle has uh, been uh, leading uh, a number of uh, phase three randomized uh, controlled trials. So he'll be sharing his first and experience as well as uh, the finer points about why he started the results in this lead. Professor Bartle, please. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Am, am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. Is the screen visible, Sian? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, so uh, thank you, Sian, and uh, for giving me this opportunity. Actually, uh, when I took this talk, I was not expecting this kind of lecture. Uh, uh, I don't enjoy uh, talking much negative about research. So uh, it was a 
tough task for me to make the slides and uh, let's see that uh, what i'm going to tell you is rather than giving my personal uh, experience about my studies i'm going to talk you if i see a clinical study how would i go about to see whether the results are would to my interpretations are appropriate or not and let's start now what i think is whenever you do a study the goal is not to look at the whether it's statistically significant or not the goal is for me is whether your experimental intervention was safe first of all the safety should be first and second whether the benefit you get is clinically meaningful or not and we will stick in the stock to these two factors safety and whether the results were clinically meaningful or not uh, this this publication i uh, when i saw the topic uh, i was expectantly expecting something in head and neck cancer or something on brain tumors on which i do work uh, but when i talked to that i had to do quite a bit of uh, reading to put my thoughts in this uh, lecture but uh, how do you first of all identify bias and how would you avoid bias most of us do this thing when you plan a phase 3 study we try to take into account how we would not plan a flawed study design and this would be some things which uh i would be talking on these eight points now whenever i look at a study the first thing which can actually impact the results is like having an inappropriate study population and let's look at this what i mean by inappropriate study population and this is catching over where dr booth left like the trials which we do most of the trials recruit patients which actually do not represent and the patient population which we see in clinical practice and this is uh, this is one example of this and in this study the authors looked at patients with multiple myeloma and you could be surprised that nearly 72.3% of the patients which are recruited in the trial or in real world practice nearly 72.3 nearly 70% of the patients won't have been eligible for these trials what does it mean is it questions whatever interpretation or results you got from the trial whether they are applicable in your day to day practice is this true for radiation oncology practice yes it's true for radiation oncology practice also in this nice publication which was way back reported in astro in 2008 it was seen that the same story that nearly 30% of patients seen in the radiation oncology practice also are not eligible for the clinical trials and we nearly extrapolate results from these supra selective patients to this patients is it true right now also it's true this is the results of flora study in which any gfr mutated non small cell lung cancer with osimertinib was given versus gefitinib and erlotinib it did lead to quite benefit in terms of improvement in pfs and os interesting was patient with only ps021 without any deterioration over last two weeks were selected i looked at the literature in tata ps2 patients in lung cancer is nearly 40% i looked at other institutes across india and i got a publication from prabhat malik which suggested that nearly 30% of patient in aims would be ps2 so which this means that again these results may not be applicable in nearly 30 to 40% of your patients of egf or mutated disease so what i'm trying to convey is that if you have a common tumor and you are using supra selective criteria for interventions it becomes difficult when these results come out to be used in routine practice so that is inappropriate now if you have a common tumor and an uncommon situation for example you wanted to study patients who underwent have recurrence in head and neck cancer the undergo salvage surgery whether giving re radiation benefits or not a randomized study of patients of get head and neck cancer recurrence they undergo surgery and then randomized re radiation or not an uncommon situation in which you can be supra selective technological trials like if you want to do a trial for brachytherapy you need to be the the cancer should be in a such a way that it is possible for you to do brachytherapy in that you can be supra selective in terms of for medical oncology practice for driver mutated uh, diseases if you are planning some targeted therapy you can be supra selective but this is okay but this is not now why is this 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 important 
what happens is whenever you get such supra selective results especially in palliative settings and these do not get replicated in the real world this is a few trials which have not shown that the benefit which we got in hcc in crpc does not get replicated in real world this is an interesting article and what this article did was this article actually looked at real world data and along with that it looked at data from randomized controlled trials if this f value is less than 1 then the real uh, the rct actually underestimates the real world outcome if the f value is greater than 1 the rct overestimated the real world outcomes and you could see that for most of the trials this is what is true the rct actually overestimates the real world outcomes and if you look at this across multiple there are multiple cancer sites breast colorectal lung this is true for nearly all cancer sites and this is true for both for radiation surgery and medical oncology studies that rcts commonly if overestimate the benefit than that actually is seen in real world what is the solution in the such uh, solution the solution here is to plan more studies which are something like a pragmatic study what was the question rather than that you actually do not have hard very rigid inclusion criteria what i mean by is do not exclude patient with performance status 2 do not exclude patient with comorbidities do not exclude patients who are have hiv who are on art but can are still doing well and there is a, a trend towards doing that also as to recently a year back actually pushed investigators and even pharma saying that these these things would be looked in future while giving approval that ps2 needs to be included patient with brain matters needs to be included and i will give an example i have talked about flora study look at the survival with jeftinib seen in the flora study at 24 months is nearly 70% this was our own study which got published in uh, journal of clinical oncology and this was jeftinib versus jeftinib plum carbo we were we were quite pragmatic about the recruitment ps2 got recruited brain metastasis got recruited and that gets reflected the jeftinib had a median overall survival of nearly only 17 months which is far lesser than what you saw in flora study commonly this study gets compared with the study and it said that the results are not so nice in the tmh study the reason is tmh study actually took real world patient population so the answer is if as far as possible whenever you read a paper or you are planning a study do look at how much of these patients eligibility criteria would be applicable in your real world real world patients better if you are investigators or young investigators or even for old investigators you are planning a study do not be rigid with inclusion criteria take patients who have comorbidities take patients who have performance to take patients who have brain metastasis and then the data reflects on the real world the second thing which which i would look is how was the standard arm of the study whether the standard arm was weak or it was no arm also this is an interesting thing which i read across few papers i'll come to what is no arm trials so this is an interesting analysis which got published in jama oncology and what they looked at is for all uh, drugs which were uh, approved by fda or those anti cancer drugs which uh, if we were successful wanted an fda approval they looked at these trials control arms and when i look at these for control arms and this is the proportion and what you see in this light color is suboptimal controls and you see that in around 5% of the studies there were suboptimal controls the interesting thing is out of the drugs which got fda approval 17% of them had suboptimal control now obviously when you keep a suboptimal control the chances of your experimental arm doing well is higher the probability is higher how how can you make the control suboptimal that was by you didn't use the most active treatment at that time for example in this alzang study what they were looking at was one anaplastic uh, uh, nhls and they didn't 
allowed the use of HDAC inhibitors. They allowed use of exalotin and methotrexate in compared to brentuximab and midotoxin, which at that time, the HDAC inhibitors were one of the approved therapies. Other is that you do not allow or you allow those combinations which are already been exposed. So let's say that patient has already got explained to cispatin and you keep the control arm at cispatin again. That's the way the most of these suboptimal controls were seen in this FDA approval studies. Now, when you look at this, this is in more in details about uh, the way this was the anaplastic large cell lymphoma study in which HDAC inhibitors are not allowed. The same way you could look at the SN4 study Serotonin was the investigation agent. Crizotinib had got FDA approval before that, but they used the control of a platinum-based therapy. We do not know from that data for crizotinib, they had got an accelerated approval at the fact that crizotinib is better than platinum-based therapy. So serotonin was never, never at that time, didn't got compared with, it did got subsequently, but the point is that you need to be very about studies in which there is a suboptimal control. And I'll come to you with why. The reason is, Let's say that creosotinib was approved at that time. It was better than pemetinib platinum. You also approved serotonin. You actually never knew at that time when you got approved whether how is its activity in this in front of creosotinib. I'll give one more example. CML, when in this bosotinib study, the control arm used was imatinib. We knew that for a major molecular response, nilotinib and dasatinib are better than imatinib. And they were approved when the study started. Again, they used a weak control arm. The, you already had nilotinib and dasatinib. One more molecule was going to be added. Yet the interest explanation was whether it was better than this or this molecule, not this molecule. Now you have nilotinib, dasatinib, and bosotinib are choice of using one of the three drugs, and you actually don't know which among them is the best drug. So the point is, look at the control arm, whether it was an inappropriate control arm. Now, this is not a typo. I kept it because these are not trials. These interventions that become standard of care on basis of retrospective single arm studies. We never get efficacy data. We may have small adverse event related data and by general consensus, maybe financially driven or not driven, these interventions become standard of care. I'm talking about technological advances becoming standard of care in, without having any randomized control data. We all know that when we talk about single arm study, there's in general low power, these are super selective, they lack generalizability. Like for example, if I'm going to do robotic surgery for cervical cancer, I need to train my surgeons for that. New surgeons will have a learning curve and they cannot directly uh, be able to reciprocate the same kinds of results. And there is something like residual confounding in, in non-compared data. Let's look at this. And I, I think this is a very striking example. Minimal invasive surgery versus abdominal radical hysterectomy for cervical cancer. This was the first randomized study done for cervical cancer. As we all are used to say, minimal invasive surgery, less intraoperative blood loss, shorter length of hospital stay, low postoperative complication. Sounds great. There is less chance of the patients having adverse events. We always had some single arm studies or retrospective arm studies showing that the five-year DFS or OS is nearly the same as the open approach. Most of this, on basis of this, it actually became the standard of care. And I'll show you how post-2008, when these publications of single arm studies, this actually started been using to a larger extent, in, especially in developed countries, and now even it, it was been used in India. The rest to this approach is just because something looks safe in a supra-selected population, and in the supra-selected population, most of the times these patients selected are good, good biology patients, small tumor size, and nodes don't exist. We can't compare the results with historical controls and say that this is good. And this is what happened in this study. We saw that doing minimally invasive surgery increased the risk of recurrence by three times, increased the risk of disease-free survival by three times, and in early stage survival cancer, we lost women because of performing minimally invasive surgery where open surgery would have done equally good. And this was in the randomized setting. At the same study, when this study got published in New England Journal of Medicine, they actually looked at the databases from United Nations uh, looking for 
a match point analysis of patients of open surgery versus minimally invasive surgeries open surgery patients still had higher amount of disease but surprisingly in real world data also minimally invasive surgery the survivals were lower than open surgery and what this meant was the survival curve of four in the relative survival rate this is for united states it was increasing steadily post adoption of practice of minimally invasive radical hysterectomy you see as the proportion of radical hysterectomy started growing the survival started dipping i think we made a hasty decision of not testing a technology or a procedure adequately before uh, taking it in clinical practice we we normally have a tendency to be having quite a bit of focus on pharma 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 sponsored studies of pharmacological agents but sometimes we lose focus with respect to these but it and the issue is pharmacological sponsored drugs most of the times come in palliative settings most of the technological based advances come in curative setting and a, a lapse in these uh a vigorous assessment of these studies can lead to hampering the overall survival in patients in whom we believe they would have lived quite a bit longer is this true only for cervical cancer no this was seen in even in rectal cancers we again had a no arm studies multiple single arm studies were taken and we followed up with multiple uh, randomized six randomized studies same conclusion that it should be exercised with caution has not proven safety with respect to short term oncological outcomes we and i'm very sure you would have thoracic uh, surgeons and you would be interacting with this with them this is an analysis done in 2013 up till now the first randomized study of wats versus open has not come on the basis of this multiple single arm retrospective observational studies and you could see the number of patients who were got subjected till 2010 itself for wats without knowing the oncological safety of this safety of this and this meta analysis was done we didn't know the safety of this and this studies did show that retrospectively wats is as good as open i hope that it comes even in the randomized study it did show that it decreases multiple side effects and probably that's the reason even my thoracic surgeons would say no this is something we want to use and quite they regularly use it the problem is when you look at the randomized study data this is a 400 plus patient randomized 600 nearly patient randomized study the fire dfs and os are the key endpoints and the data is awaited in around one and a half years back we got the data for the acute toxicities look at the duration of time 150 150 16 minutes extra with open surgery on a median that is statistically significant blood loss 100 ml 100 ml 100 ml i think this might be because of distribution of blood loss to be slightly higher on the open open that duration of chest strain is same total volume of chest strain is nearly same length of hospital nearly same post operative complications also are nearly same this is in crossly against what was shown in a 7 years back meta analysis the reason is simple supra selective patients were selected for wats in the study and obviously when you compare apples with oranges you are going to get results like this and when you look about all the complications but see here that all the complications with open surgery were as good as which were done with wats including those four five complications which i had shown before what does this mean yeah we need to adopt new technologies but we should not be adopting them before we have good randomized clinical trials another example of head and neck cancer simple radiotherapy with or without chemo radio chemotherapy can take care of oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma we wanted to complicate things by getting a doing trans oral robotic surgery and doing a neck dissection along with that was a phase 2 study the study wanted to show that if you avoided radiotherapy giving this treatment would lead to an improvement in quality of life the study results were exactly the opposite when rt alone actually led to a preservation of quality of life and tors did not ideally with this this practice of doing tors with neck dissection should have stopped we should not be going forward when a, the phase 2 study 
has been shown that it does there was no benefit in terms of overall survival or disease free survival and the quality of life was bad as was spoken by my previous speaker if you have shown that there is a sustained loss of the quality of life which is cleaning really meaningful also then you should not have we should not be continuing with this practice going ahead in head and neck cancer if you ask most of your colleagues who had an excursion they would say which is a better surgery for the patient free flap okay there are some reconstruction which cannot be done with pedicle flap that free flap is an answer but some reconstruction which can be done with a pedicle flap but still we would always talk about doing a free flap more costly for the patient but when you look at this results of this meta analysis you could see that most of the thing it's higher cost higher incidence of post op revision higher incidence of necrosis and you could see that there is a twist in con conclusion saying that it seems to be superior for several outcomes what we must realize is when you have multiple retrospective single arm studies you could have results which can come this way so always remember that whichever thing you adopt unless to please do not consider making it a routine use or routine as a standard without having good level evidence data we come to giving radiation in end to lymph nodes common practice we didn't do so practice at tmh in some some uh, radiation colleagues would give some would not give and there was a consideration on multiple post hoc analysis that this would benefit esmo 2020 did show that there is no benefit of giving radiation in uh, in this setting again the message is please do not start making conclusions on data which have no comparative arms we can criticize for comparative arms but we need that data to come so that we can know why we should be using this therapy let's come to the next uh, thing which is can mislead our results is an inappropriate endpoint definition i have taken an interesting example here and let's revisit to this famous study in new england journal of medicine rtog 911 this was a study most of you might be knowing but i'll just let you know this was a study at which we were not sure what would the best strategy for larynx preservation three arm study one arm we gave chemo radiation 100 mg per meter per cisplatin with conventional radiation one arm received only radical radiation and third arm received neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by only radiation no chemo radiation so it's neoadjuvant chemo followed by radiation that's it we have comparing concurrent chemo radiation versus a sequential chemo radiation and only radiation these results got published at that time in new england journal of medicine 2003 the primary endpoint was preservation of larynx and let's look at the results the look results were very clear that preservation of larynx was best done with ctrt and that was to the extent of 85% near term chemotherapy followed by radiotherapy it does it to the extent of 75% given only radiotherapy alone still is good 70% a message from quite a few of my young radiation colleagues do not think that giving radiation itself is not a good treatment quite a time i come across is when young radiation uncle says he is not fit for chemo maybe it may not benefit for radiation no radiation alone can do quite a good job nearly 70% of larynx were preserved and what you see just larynx preservation continued till 5 years good i was a student of this came before i actually joined relation oncology and when i looked at the results no doubt in my mind that ctrt should be considered the standard of care nacti followed by radiotherapy may be the next best option and radiotherapy alone is the last best option for these patients and so was ncsn and so were most of our colleagues and ctrt became and uh, vigorously was followed for the next decades in years back we get these results this is an updated data for rtog 911 let's look at this larynx preservation it's still continuing and here is nearly 85% but when i look at loco regional control i see that okay still quite a few patients local control is maintained but when i look at the survival curve i see that patients are not surviving how come is that the survival at 10 year is 30% the larynx preservation at 10 years is 85% and and this is the time actually i never used to read the trials in that detail and i actually started 
looking at the reason why is that uh, so first thoughts which came to my mind was whether they were looking at only patients who were surviving then when i look at the number at risk data no that's not the case all patients are being taken so why is that patients who have larynx preserved but they have died which means the first thing which you get is what was the definition of primary endpoint use the primary endpoint was preservation of the larynx so what was the event for preservation of larynx the event was preservation of larynx was the date was whether laryngectomy was done or not so those of you when you do kaplan meckers you know that we need to put something as event and rest all get sensors sensor the the event which was put was whether laryngectomy was done or not if the patient had failed in larynx but if had it undergone laryngectomy for any reason it was censored if the patient had died it was for any reason because of laryngeal recurrence node and recurrence distance it was censored if the patient had a death because of any other reason it was censored what means that you were not looking at functional preservation you were looking at anatomical preservation and which gave this results in which it did seem that the larynx preservation was much higher in ctrt a quite nice dissection of this was done in a paper by another prominent radiation uh, prominent radiation uh, oncologist and a medical oncologist and where they actually compared what was happening to these patients when you look at 10 years what are the number of patients who were alive supposing the lot more patients were alive with induction chemo followed by radiation than than look by ctrt then how come is that the even the laryngectomy free survival was nearly looking similar the results were a lot more amount of patient died in ctrt uh, arms before they could undergo total laryngectomy the rates of total laryngectomy which were done were much higher in the induction chemotherapy arm and that's the reason why this was put as an event and that's the reason why the laryngeal preservation rates and even the laryngeal food survival will lower in the induction followed by ctrt arm and to say it exactly in the word of lisa lesetra to this analysis misled the interpretation in the concomitant arm associated with the larynx preservation in a very delusive and optimistic directions there were higher mortality rate in the concomitant arm and hence there was decreased rates of total laryngectomy which was done the issue is what i want to point out to you is that whenever you read a study please read the definition of primary endpoint how it was defined very clearly we can have an and uh, we can have like when we see progression free survival whether that was included as an event with pre operation free survival or not for example some patients may get some kind of very toxic therapy he may die because of toxicity of the treatment but he had not progressed at that if this that is not considered as an event but is censored it will falsely show results in favor of that experimental arm which is very toxic as a result of lot of this a uh, controversy over life preservation rate a definition was given for future studies which includes death local relapse laryngectomy tracheostomies and even feeding tubes uh, to be taken as an event now let's look at that one example is suitable for you to understand that you need to read study carefully and need to interpret them carefully let's talk about inappropriate endpoints so clinically non relevant endpoints there was a question that how good is something good to approve a drug how much improvement in survival is required the problem is do we can say that median survival improves from this to this what if at one year the survival is bang same in both the arms let's say that median improved from 3 months to 6 months but at the end of one year in both arm we have 10% patient surviving that's one situation we need to think about second situation is a very common situation and if there are any medical oncologist they would know this in most of the immunotherapy studies the median survival median survival most of them doesn't increase but the one year and two year survivals double so do we say that because median has not increased we do not offer this treatment so that what are things which we need to ponder upon obviously the gold standard endpoint is overall survival the next endpoints are pfs dfs and event free then come quality of life and we can have some endpoints which can be symptom specific also now how do we decide which to choose as was spoken by my previous speaker also 
is now good the good level of guidance on this the smo magnitude of benefits case actually tells you that what should be the end points when you are looking in curative setting what should be the end points looking in palliative setting what should be the magnitude of benefit that would be considered reasonably good by the advocates of smo similarly there is a framework given by asco in which it would be considered good this is what has been given in that which clinical endpoints are included they are also given to what magnitude they should be improved sadly most of them are not talked about cost in details of how much improvement should be considered as cost effective and that actually is is correct cost would have a different uh, uh, there would be a different perspective of the patient It will be different perspective if the nation is providing treatment for all, like is it nice guidelines. It will be different perspective if the patient is buying this treatment for him. So something which is cost effective for a money may not be cost effective for someone who is staying across the road. So let's look at what can be inappropriate endpoints. Let's look at this. biochemical progression free failure in prostate cancer most of you young radiation oncologists and few medical oncologists who are there this will be a common endpoint using in prostate cancer studies this is a nice paper stand position paper coming from european society of fetal oncologists which says that this is not necessarily a biochemical leads to clinically apparent to progressive disease and may not be a marker of oral survival This is a network analysis of an analysis done in 2015, and what we see here is that most of the time the biochemical progression free survival improves, but there is no improvement in other hard clinical endpoints. And why is this important? This is important because most of the studies, most of the studies which have shown benefit have shown in biochemical progression free survival, and if you go for a hard endpoint like oral survival, there is no benefit seen. with respect to most of these advances or with respect to most of these therapies or most most of these drugs interestingly i'll put you across this this was one study which got published recently in lancet in october 2020 it looks at whether timing of radiotherapy for radical prostatectomy makes a difference patients who after radical prostatectomy were indicated for radiation adjuvant were in one arm we given immediate one arm we given at salvage and this was based on previous data which did show that giving external beam radiation may have some benefit with respect to uh, uh, biochemical progression free survival and and what the study did show was the endpoint which was used for the hard endpoint of clinical failure no there was no benefit in terms of giving early radiation uh, in this patient when you look at the hard end point another study which got published in lancet this got published in lancet this got published in lancet oncology same design adjunct radiotherapy was early salvage used biochemical progression free survival as an end point i'll come to this study after a after a bit more time but it used biochemical progression free survival as an end point what i'm trying to tell you is that read the papers carefully what endpoint has been used quite a few times you get a habit of seeing that the study was positive well it was positive for what if it's positive for in biochemical progression free survival endpoint which in prostate cancer in ovarian cancer how minimal benefit it may be a benefit like when you look at tumor markers in something like germ cell tumor it may have benefit but not in these cancers let's look at another reason why your endpoint should be carefully selected and why you should not be going only with respect to adverse events when you get to so a few years back we we knew that in head and neck cancer for curative treatment for radical treatment uh, those were locally advanced cisplatin plus radiotherapy was better than radiotherapy and it was used in the mckenzie analysis we got a bonus study which was done in patients who were cisplatin eligible and in this it was shown that cytoxine plus radiation was better than radiation and for a long time till last year nccn used to give category one recommendation for cisplatin plus rt cytoxine plus rt and another regimen which was used by the french the carboplatin 5 u plus rt as a radiation sensitizer and quite a few uh, international speakers or even used to use this option in this patients 
Uh, thankfully, this was a costly option and was not used most of the time in government setup. And that's thankfully because we know that in HPV positive patients, when these two arms were compared, it did show that this is much better than this, this therapy. Again, pointing out that probably until you don't have these comparisons between the two category one regimen, it's better to go with that regimen, which is a better established treatment. And that better established treatment needs to be compared whenever you are comparing for a new regimen. Now, for those who, uh, uh, you can put this in chat box. This is a randomized study in which the red arm has a better peer, uh, a better progression free survival than this blue arm. And this two is the tune of around eight to 10%. Now, which arm would you choose if you could want to use in clinical practice? Most of the time people would say is the red arm. This diagram is actually from the passport study. This is for conventional 3D CRT and this is for IMRT. This was a 94 patient study. Before this IMRT had got established was used by most of the centers. As I told you, technological advances get adapted very fast. Small study only of 94 patients. 47, 47 get randomized. Evaluable for primary endpoint, which was xerostomia. So in a curative setting, we allowed a technological advance to come without even looking at non-infinity for important hardcore endpoints like local regional recurrence, which would be a good endpoint for head and neck cancer. 34 evaluated patients for primary and 39. And when you look at this, five deaths here and those many recurrences and here are uh, 10 deaths and nearly seven recurrences. And what we got was yes, IMRT was better. IMRT lead to a decrease in xerostomia. But way back in 2009-10, would you have taken this evidence to take the leap of faith that IMRT won't harm the patients for OS or DFS? What would have been the story if someone comes with a study of an 800 patient and shows that no, giving IMRT actually leads, does not lead to that benefit with respect to oral survival or DFS. And I wonder about this. Mind you, IMRT is good and we use it. But for discussion purpose, I was telling you that we need, whenever you adapt a technological advance, you need to have a look at this. Were all side effects uh, better with respect to IMRT? No. Fatigue and dysphagia was higher in the IMRT arm in this study. Now, there is a one conclusion which uh, the uh, passport authors said, the, doing a non-infinity will amount to doing nearly 900 patients uh, study, and that's not feasible to get recruited. Surprisingly, the RTOG 0522 recruited nearly 891 patients over two years. So what again it means that if you want to do it, you would get the patients to do it. Now, if I tell you that in oral cancers, post surgery, I do IMRT, the primary endpoint, this is a, this is a completely hypothetical situation. Primary endpoint is xerostomia. And I do arm B, another technological advance, and the xerostomia will come down from 50% to 0% with overall survival is the same. But we want to look at other hardcore endpoints. I don't know how acceptable it to be most of us, but this is what we accepted when we accepted the study. And what it will do is, this is exactly what we see that there is same overall survival in this randomized study done from Orissa, whether you do post of radiotherapy or not as an adjuvant in oral cancers. Obviously because radiotherapy was not even the xerostomia would come down. The issue is we do not, should not be taking newer therapies, drug, surgery, or technology without testing it. Another study, to put this point forward, a space study called SBRT versus conventional factory radiotherapy and was done in stage one non-small cell lung cancer. The first endpoint, I liked that. It was an overall survival and hard endpoint, which would take into account the deaths due to adverse events and all. But the authors were so convinced that conventional radiotherapy is bad that it won't reach that 30% survival mark, they degraded it to having a primary input of PFS and they accepted a power of 67% willingly saying that no, this would come as a positive study. I'm not going to tell you what is the red curve is doing better and the hash curve is not doing that better. This is the arm B and this is the arm A. 
let's look in the next slide to see what is arm A and arm B. And to a lot of surprise, the curve which was the red curve is actually a 3D CRT curve, which means to something which we were unbelievably be unbelievable for the authors, what was actually was seen in the study that conventionally done 3D CRT was nearly as good as BRD in the study with both of these two PFS and overall survival. Again, point to the point out that these technological advances or any advance should not be taken without doing a proper study with a hard endpoint and with adequate power. Now, another thing with well, the conclusions got twisted is concluding non-infinity in superiority studies. A famous example I'll give before I come to the next slide is uh, giving gemcitabine and cisplatin and palliotherapy in uh, CA bladder. The study actually was to show that gemcitabine and cisplatin should be superior than the classic MVAC regimen. It failed to show that it is superior, but because the outcomes are similar, the authors concluded that and most of the guidelines have accepted it. Now, this is another interesting study and I was very happy when I looked at this study. It is a randomized study done in glottic cancer. So I'm happy because there are two therapeutic models, the traditional good old radiotherapy for glottic cancer, quite challenged in 90s by lasers done in glottic cancer. And the lasers have never got head to head compared with the uh, radiation schedules. The reason, the reason which is given is that we don't find adequate patients to that and it's difficult to do randomized study in glottic cancers. I think we should have asked the Japanese to do it because they did this of doing a therapy or accelerated fractionation versus standard fractionation. Let's come to the conclusion. The conclusion here was the accelerated fractionation actually failed to show non-infinity with respect to the standard fractionation. But however, because the outcomes broadly seem similar, you then the toxicity of accelerated fraction was also broadly similar. And because it would finish faster, the authors actually recommended that it could be a potential treatment option. Now, statistically, such conclusions should not have been drawn. And this is the, uh, the trial of salvage versus early radiotherapy for radical prostatectomy, which I was talking about. And what it shows is that when you do the, uh, in the study, it was seen that the biochemical progression to survival, again, did not match the non infinity levels when you give early salvage therapy. And in spite of this levels will not match, they actually concluded that because it spared the side effects, you should probably could use early salvage radiotherapy. What I'm trying to say is that it's quite typical and it is incorrect that you do a non, uh, non infinity study, you do not do the non infinity, and then you actually interpret the results other way around. If you had to interpret the results other way around, the margin of non infinity should have been kept that wide. If you don't keep that wide, this actually are like post hoc assumptions, which are actually statistically inappropriate. Now, whenever this study is an another interesting study. This is non-small cell lung cancer with brain mets. And in this, patients are randomized in one arm in dexamethasone with supportive care without anything else. Other arm, you go dexamethasone, supportive care, whole brain radiotherapy. This is, I've kept it in, in this is in the section of uh, non-infinity uh, non trial, but uh, this is a, this was the classical example of using too much of a real world kind patients who may not have benefited from that kind of therapy. And I'll come to you what. So for me, whole brain RT remains a standard of care for patients who are brain meds. But in this study, there was no benefit with respect to any hard endpoints like overall survival, no benefit in quality of life with respect to dexamethasone. And that's the reason why they concluded that WBRT provides little additional clinical benefit to this patient's group. Why do this, they got this results. The results they got is because the performance status less than 70 contributed to nearly 40% of these patients. Poor RPA class in which Holbein RT is not indicated contributed to nearly another 40% in this study. What we must understand is it's good that you have wider criteria as I was speaking about, but it should not be so wider that the intervention becomes worthless and then you draw conclusions which may be inappropriate. 
another issue which comes in the studies is that you would have differential assessment schedules and differential post failure treatment what i meant about differential assessment schedule is what to what other the earlier speaker said we always think that progression free survival or response rates are a hard end point problem is if you have a differential schedule in some patients you do scans more regularly like that one 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 month interval in some uh, patients if you do a two 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 months interval there's a good probability that in those patients in whom you do scans at one one month interval there's a likelihood that these patients would have a lower progression from survival so this is another thing which you need to assess that the assessment schedules especially when you have such end point that progression free survival the same across both arms so give you one example of why post failure treatment important and this is what we see saw in our, our study we compared old study of jeftinib versus pemetrexid plus platinum in egfr mutated patients progression free survival was better with jeftinib and was not so good with permitexid plus platinum surprisingly this is not converted into an overall survival difference so most of you may say that's true in many patients it does not convert the problem was the median survival which we got in jeftinib arm was 18 months what we got in permitexid plus platinum arm was 23 months we were more uh, surprised by why the permitexid plus platinum arm did better than jeftinib arm the results were many of the patients post treatment progression actually didn't receive treatment in jeftinib arm and it was 38 out of nearly two uh, uh, this was 240 uh, patient study nearly when patients progressed on jeftinib arm, only 70% of them got therapy reasons the reasons were the, those kind of soft guidelines which were there at that time which we followed patient is only brain metastasis give local therapy and continue jeftinib the problem was this patients when they came back were in poor progress performance status asymptomatic progression continue jeftinib patient came back in such a poor performance status that they could we couldn't do anything and quite a few patients actually came back in poor performance status at the first progression itself what is the moral of the story the moral of the story is you therapies especially if they are good salvageable therapies when given in second line can have impact on key outcomes and hence we need to see whether the arms even if the intervention is over treatment after them was well balanced or not patients in pemetrexid platinum arm 95% of them were shifted to jeftinib here only 70% got second line therapy let's come up to another issue which uh, clouds our decision making when we look at uh, random study let's talk about underpowered trials now this is an interesting study and this is was published in green journal the study looked at decreasing the dose of radiation for elective neck radiation from 50 gray to 40 gray the primary end point for this again surprisingly what not loco regional failure or disease free survival over survival but was the rate of dysphagia now to me it seems logical that if you decrease the dose the dysphagia should decrease what i would have been more interested in knowing in from this random eye study is that whether giving less dose of 40 a primary end point should have been for local regional recurrence or disease free survival so it again comes into that category also that's an inappropriate end point was selected the issue was this was a 200 patient study and after they found that this there were two publications which sorry the second publication and there is another repeat publication which they updated the results in 2020 and they have claimed that giving a dose of 40 same same to have similar oncological outcomes and the study was underpowered to say that any firm thing on this with respect to oncological outcomes now if the study is underpowered these things are known to you before the start of the study doing an underpowered study is actually according to me unethical you you used your resource you used the patient's resource and you are not going to get any firm conclusions on this now what about at the same time what's happening with respect to the fda anti cancer drugs this is though the topic is underpowered quite a bit of fda studies are actually doing overpowering this is actually what dr booth also 
to about 2000 patient studies 3000 patient studies and you look at that 80% of them which have effect size greater than what was predicted in statistical plan clearly suggesting that the powers were they were overpower study doing even an overpower study is not correct interestingly for young investigators please power the study adequately use the minimum magnitude benefit which is required for you to take this to call this as clinically meaningful for to you use in studies another thing which clouds our judgment is doing post hoc analysis this is a study which my thoracic oncologic colleagues who common interact with the thoracic surgeons will be well versed with locally advanced n2 non small cell lung cancers are given three cycles of platinum based induction and they are randomly assigned to do surgical resection or radiotherapy after near joint chemotherapy whether you do this or whether you do this the rates are of overall survival median are nearly same pointing to this radiation is as good as surgical resection come to one more study in which what was done was given was given chemo radiation both uh, sesito was given to a dose of 45 gram patient who did not progress in one arm went i uh, uninterrupted to receive a dose up to 61 degree and another time resection was done primary endpoint overall survival the end point was to show a superiority of surgery over radiation what it did show was there was no benefit in terms of median overs or one year or two year of survival between these two arms a post hoc analysis was done which showed that overall survival so improved for patients who underwent low back but not even acting why i'm pointing out to this most of guidelines would be using this post hoc analysis as a reason to support doing surgery over continuation of chemo radiation say putting this evidence as for uh, to be having a better overall survival you must understand this was an exploratory analysis an exploratory analysis should best be considered as hypothesis generating and not as confirmatory this was a tough topic for me and uh, i don't like to look at so many negative aspect but i don't think everything is bad these were selected examples which i had to pull across to i would have got much more examples with uh, on drug trials but because there was predominantly going to be a radiation oncology trial and looked for local therapy trials remember ultimate goal of research is not objectivity but to get to truth and to benefit our patients patients and that is all thank you if you have any questions i'd like to take it thank you professor uh, again excellent discussion with lots and lots of examples uh probably that's what we was i was looking at so that uh, the participants get to know with so many examples uh, those of you having questions can directly unmute themselves and ask to the panel directly vijay this is shantam can you hear me ha ah, shantam sunai de okay so first of all an excellent talk thank you i would like to ask you about your uh, talk on uh, point on uh, end point selection an appropriate end point selection when you had mentioned that uh, the choice of end point selection should be dependent upon uh, hard end points when you are investigating new studies you are absolutely right and i think this is very very important that we actually choose uh, soft end points like toxicity and all those things but that said if you are actually looking at a technical uh, thing like intensity modulated radiotherapy it is actually unreasonable to expect an overall survival benefit unless and until you are doing something like a dose escalation or something like that i personally believe that the prudent approach would be to actually power it to a more uh, better end point like you know q2 twist analysis or quality of life adjusted life year analysis what are your thoughts on this Yeah, I agree with that, Chantam. The the reason why I didn't like that endpoint of zero stomia is because the zero stomia was supposed to be assessed at one year, and uh, I was actually surprised uh, when they actually are planning to do with the chi-square test. We both know that many patients would die on 
fall off before that endpoint even is reached. Uh, when I meant hard endpoint, I meant something like overall survival. I even don't consider progression free survival as a hard endpoint. A quality of life, according to me, is actually a hard endpoint. Or a cure twist analysis also a hard endpoint. In fact, uh, if uh, you do quality of life analysis, taking death also as an event, what we do in the uh, uh, time to decrement or time to loss of quality of life or time to maintenance of quality of life. According to me, that would have been a much better analysis to be done in this kind of situations. So I agree that it's good to have new advances coming, but we need to test them appropriately with good endpoints. And uh, quality of life for me is a very good endpoint. In my experience, after doing quite a bit of randomized studies, what I have seen is it is very difficult to improve quality of life. So if some uh, intervention actually improves your quality of life, you might get an improvement in PFS, you might get an improvement in response, but it's very difficult to get improvement in quality of life. So if you get an improvement in quality of life, that according to me is actually a good endpoint to achieve for the patients. Yeah, thank you. Uh... There's one comment in the chat box that we have asked your email ID. I'll share that. I'll, I'll, I'll put you an email with the slides and uh, this uh, uh, email ID. Put it. It's actually very simple. vjpgi at the rate of gmail.com. Thank you. Uh, Sir, and... Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. It was a wonderful talk. So uh, just can you please elaborate that what is the caveat if uh, the hard endpoint like overall survival is a secondary endpoint. So the result of uh, the secondary endpoint like overall survival. So won't it be as good uh, in the same study as it uh, like if the overall survival was the primary endpoint. So what difference does it make if you are comparing uh, overall survival as a primary endpoint of a study and a secondary endpoint of the study? Okay. But well, that's actually a very good question. So uh, let's first understand what is a primary endpoint or the secondary endpoint. So when we design a study, we design a study so that whatever intervention we are testing, we have a baseline assumption. We say that this intervention would lead to an increment in something. Let's say increment in X from this level to this level. With this amount of false positive rate with this amount of false negative rate. And we have adjusted for this with this equation, we get an output of what sample size you require. That x, what we decide, actually is the primary endpoint. So your study is actually powered, statistically speaking, only for the primary endpoint. So when you power the study for overall survival, your results for overall survival are what it matters because your equation at the start of the study when you designed it go for overall survival. Rest all is secondary. I'll give an example. That's for example, you talk about, uh, let's say that increment in response, we take it. Something which goes from 25% to, let's say, a jump of 70%. So my analysis is powered for this jump from 25% to 75%. It's actually not powered for me to look at what were the two-year overall survival or five-year overall survival for population free survival. It's not powered. So what results you get in secondary endpoints, if they are not in line with the primary endpoints, they can well be because of false positive results. That's the difference. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions from the participants? Hello, Vijay. Uh, Arun Shankar here. Ah, hi, Arun. Uh, hi. So, uh, hi, would it be nice if you can uh, share your, uh, uh, on your audio, yeah, uh, video. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so continue, <laughs> continue with the last question. So yes. what is your take on the uh, hydrogen dosimeter after surgery? Okay, so what is my take on hydrogen dosimeter? Dosimeter with adjun on, ad on, adjun setting or not? Yeah, so that, that that's a question which I was anticipating someone to ask about what would be the take on adjun dosimeter in it. I might that uh, I discuss those uh, options with my patients. 
if they want to take it they take it it upon them so it's it has shown to be beneficial with respect to dfs it has shown to be beneficial with respect to survival so so i discuss that option and i leave it there do i tell every patient like for example if someone comes for taking a uh, uh, adjunct radiation and has extra capsule and oral extension i won't give the option of not giving cisplatin i said you need quite to take cisplatin along with this i won't do that with adjunct osimertinib i would say that this if you take this this is this is the risk if you don't take it this is the risk it's up to you to decide so in short i i offer it to all patient but uh, the offering is in a way that uh, they have they can choose what they want Okay. Uh, so, you do you explain that there might not be a uh, overall survival benefit later? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, but that study of uh, June had a overall survival benefit also. All but it was there. I did not explain that. That is a very small benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's... The problem is, I don't. I really don't know uh, whether uh, the 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 reason why I am. Uh, a bit skeptical about the results with osimertinib is that if you look at the flora data which came in stage 4 lung cancer of osimertinib versus gefitinib varlotinib and if you look at the asian subset population it did show that in asian subset population there was no benefit of osimertinib over uh the uh gefitinib or varlotinib and that was a surprise the reason why i say that was a surprise because at that time when the study was going on osimertinib was available as a as a second line option in us studies and not in east asian studies so the authors are actually thought that east asian patients on failure won't be getting osimertinib so the, they were expecting that the curve would be more wider in east asian patients but it was not so the curve was actually bang on top of each other in spite of patients not receiving osimertinib in second line second reason is the data which we have published from tata but most are not aware of EGFR mutated patients then in caucasians when they progress 70 to 75% of them actually develop T790M mutation so you can anticipate in them that most of the patients resistant mechanism is T790M and that's why you are giving a therapy which is targeting T790M indians what we have from our own data of gefitinib is and this is again done in trial setting of patients who volunteered for their uh, tissue to be taken at biopsies only 30% had T790M mutation and that also goes with respect to what was seen in east patients that the predominant mechanism of resistance in indians doesn't seem to be T790M mutation so do i offer i do offer but do i offer stage 4 patient osimertinib as the first is no i'm skeptical offering stage 4 stage 4 lung cancer also osimertinib as the first line option because i think that is more to the story of osimertinib respectively point taken uh so hello so yeah you go ahead compare the control i am not getting the question Dr. Navdeep, can you please repeat your question? Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, in uh, like you said that uh, the control arm must be a standard arm always. Yeah. Uh, sir, can I ask you a question? That uh, yeah. one of the studies you conducted, uh, three weekly cisplatin versus weekly cisplatin in head and neck cancer. Yeah. The uh, weekly arm you took thirty mg per meter yeah. square cisplatin, which was not the standard dose. Yeah. So, so can you please comment upon I'll, it I'll, I'll i'll comment on that and I, and for that 30 mg per meter square uh, oh, which was taken as control arms probably the jco would have been in ngm and probably the cancer nemotuzumab would have been in jco or or, or in new england journal of medicine if you are taken 40 as the control arm i'll take that question so the reason why we took 30 mg per meter square as control arm for that study is that uh, tata memorial hospital at that time Used to use 30 mg per meter square as a control arm for routinely for all their uh, routine uh, therapies, both in adjunct and radical setting. From where this is 30 came, this 30 had come from 
previous uh, people who decided that probably 40 is too toxic and 30 is good. Did we have evidence which suggested that 30 milligram per meter square of cisplatin plus RT is beneficial than RT? Yes, we had. Uh, there was a study which was done by Dr. Sarbani, madam. It was radiation versus radiation plus 30 milligram per meter square of cisplatin published in Head and Neck Cancer randomized study that did show that 30 milligram per meter square of cisplatin when added to radiation actually gives you a local regional control benefit, a, a, a disease-free survival benefit. There was a 20% increment in overall survival, but it did not uh, turn out to be statistically significant. Actually, the study never recruited completely. So there was, uh, so do we had evidence that 30 milligram per meter square will combined with radiation is better than RT? Yes, we had that evidence. Do we have evidence at that time? Did we have evidence that 40 milligram per meter square of cisplatin plus RT is better than RT alone? Yes, we had that evidence also that came from All India Institute of Medical Science. A study was done by Dr. Atul Sharma in which it was shown that that was benefit. But we went with what was used at our center. So normally you have this criteria with, with what is your institutional standard of care. Like for example, the French, for the Gotek group, that institutional standard of care is not institutional, is carboplatin plus 5-FU. So you would say that they, in the studies, won't use cisplatin 100 milligram per meter square. They would always use carboplatin 5 fu the standard of care. And we took what we were using as a routine as 30 milligram per meter square. Have we changed our practice after that study? Yeah, we have changed our practice completely. As a rule, if the patient is fit, now gets 100 milligram per meter square of cisplatin. If the patient we feel is not going to get 100, then only he gets 40 milligram per meter square of cisplatin. So was 30 milligram per meter square of cisplatin a week? Yes, it was a week. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, if you give 100 meter, uh, 100 mg per meter square, do you give it in a single day or uh, divided to two days? Okay, so there is, again, there is a, a difference in opinion here. Uh, I prefer to give it in single day. There are a few of my colleagues who want to give it in two days. The reason why I prefer to give it in single days is because there's another study, which is a part of McKinsey analysis. What they did was they gave 100 milligram per meter square, but they gave 20 milligram per meter square day one to day five schedule. This is the only study with cisplatin, which is actually negative. And the probable reason the authors give us because they give this divided schedule. So I prefer if the patient is fit, 100 milligram per meter square, you give it in 100 milligram per meter square as a single, single day dose. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Thank Sain, you. I have a... Yeah. Sorry. It's all right. Yeah, go, it's ahead. All right. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I just had a comment to make regarding a particular point regarding overpowering of studies. Yeah. It was a very excellent and a valid point, actually. And, and that study she was showed, which said that a lot of trials uh, which have, of drugs which appeared approved were overpowered. However, I would like to provide some context and maybe perspective and a bit of nuance that when people are conducting randomized trials, what they usually use as their effect size, as well as their baseline, is actually previous data. It can be single institution, it can be multi-institution, it can be from the literature. And almost always that data is dated. It's almost always around five to 10 years too late or five to 10 years behind times. Now in this, we had already discussed in previous lectures that the standard of care changes, a lot of practice changes, general conditions changed, fitness, for example, access to care, et cetera. So as if somebody is looking to conduct a proper randomized control trial, maybe not a pragmatic one, maybe an efficacy trial, I would actually advise them to overpower, slightly overpower the trial. Maybe not to the extent of 100% 100 overpowering. No, that probably is too much. But if they are expecting something like, let's say, 400 patients, just as an example, I would probably say that add around 5 to 10%, again, of just a general ballpark figure, around 5% or so, so that their baseline is not compromised. Because we see so many trials in so many sites where they did not prove superiority because their baseline changed or they had to stop the recruitment because the number even which were not there and I, I mean i'm just i'm not disagreeing with the point which was made it was an excellent point but i would say that if people are looking to conduct the trial maybe they should keep this in mind yeah i i, I agree with what uh, uh, you are saying that uh, most of the trials when they do and and they actually have uh, data which comes from phase two and they actually quote it uh, also that the data this this was the baseline it was 
uh, it was selected from phase two and this is the increment which we think we should be achieving what i have i was actually trying to insist is that uh, let's for example say that the minimum clinically benefit magnitude scale benefit which esmo would recommend is uh, let's say is around 0.7 okay when spin the hazard ratio below 0.7 if it comes or up to 0.7 they would consider that that would be a grade a type of treatment let's say for overall survival quite a few times this uh, 0.7 would be put at 0.8 or 0.85 uh, or somewhere around there and the sample size increases uh, to a larger extent so i'm not sure. i take your point I, i won't say that what i wanted to emphasize is if there is a very small benefit which is seen in 3000 patients or 4000 patients or 6000 patients i'm not very sure how good is it uh, the number required to treat for one patient to benefit is too high for me to say that i would go for that uh, i'll give you an example like for example, i agree with your point dr watel i'm i'm in fact i'm furthering it i am actually saying that 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 is the distinction between clinical yeah. significance no, I, and I, I, statistical I, I, significance but, but the and I, and and the grades and the ismo and other criteria are actually about clinically meaningful yeah. benefit rather than statistically meaningful benefit yeah. and i agree with you i'm i'm i'm, I'm just furthering your point a little bit but i would as i said i would like to sort of put more perspective and nuance to it i think that most trials when people conduct especially in india uh, and i'm talking of smaller centers not not like tmh which actually does reasonable trials but smaller centers when i see so many trials which are conducted they'll be like using 300 uh, sorry 30 patients 80 patients that is uh, criminally underpowered and i totally agree with your point when you mentioned that if we know that a trial is going to be underpowered it is unethical to conduct it yeah time do we have uh, time for one comment yeah yeah go ahead so coming to that shantanu's point regarding underpowered studies in single institutes i think as a sort of aside point i think it is extremely important that we pay even more emphasis on clinical trial registration because these small small underpowered studies if taken together Brilliant. can actually provide power i personally know of five trials which have investigated nine grays in two fractions versus seven in three in cervical cancer yeah i i completely agree with that uh, there are multiple trials which were done for 40 versus 100 and actually in trivandrum in jaipur and there was a common thesis topic which was given over last uh, 15 years so i am very sure that we would look at one weekly three weekly which has randomized 300 patients if we club them all together and measure sure more than 600 patient in trial settings have got treated to answer on the same question but individually having 50 50 100 and 100 patients I agree. I mean, I am part of usually part of the doctoral committee or the so-called thesis committee in which uh, I usually provide the statistical guidance to people, and I am constantly aggrieved to see these kind of thirty, forty patient trials, twenty in each arm, where they are trying to detect a five percent difference between forty gray, forty milligram per meter square versus hundred milligram per meter square three weekly cis pattern. That's just that's I don't know what to say to that. point well taken uh any other questions because there aren't any i think we probably will call it a day uh with this uh we come to the end of uh this uh, course on critical appraisal of medical literature uh i would like to thank professor patel for his uh, presentation uh and uh, that he agreed uh, although he had uh some personal issues because of which he couldn't take the class last week uh thanks a lot uh, to professor patel for uh, uh, i mean it's an honor to host you and uh, listen to your excellent presentation so before i finish i would i must uh, thank some of the people without whom without whose continuous support and encouragement uh, this course wouldn't have been possible so to begin with we must thank dr santan chakravarti dr sain paul dr indran malik and uh, uh, an active participation all throughout from dr santan sapru thanks thanks a lot to all of you uh, it was kind of a good learning experience for all of us uh, thank you my pleasure uh, although we would uh, liked a lot more participation from the uh, residents and junior trainees
uh, but just a, a, a word for them that uh, kindly spread the word to your colleagues that these excellent presentations will be available on YouTube. So if you find time, uh, you can uh, access them on our uh, YouTube channel uh, where we'll put up the videos. Please go through them. There is a lot of material to learn. Uh, so kindly share it with your colleagues. So any other comments from the seniors? Santandra, any comment or Dr. Sapru? Yeah, I must say I would like to thank Sion because he has taken time out and effort for doing a wonderful job with these lectures. And as he's mentioned, although I imagine many of the students actually missed out on excellent lectures, we had actually got international faculty and national faculty who actually have done clinical trials. So it is very, very important that uh, uh, students do take benefit from this and I hopefully the YouTube will continue to be a resource. Thank you, Shayan, for this excellent uh, endeavor. Thank you, sir. I would also like to thank Dr. Sayan Das and Dr. Sayan Paul as well because they were the ones who invited me to this. Thank you so much uh, for providing the platform to spread this knowledge. Hopefully, we were able to give, I was able to give some useful contribution. Hopefully, people can reach me uh, on my numbers or on my email, which you already have. And uh, for me, it was a treat to listen to Dr. Professor Ian Tanak and Professor Chris Booth. I've admired their work for some time. And it was nice to interact with them to sort of reassure that at least our thinking is aligned in the same same direction, which is which is quite gratifying actually to know, especially in a country like India, where a lot of discordant uh, thought processes abound. So it was nice. Thank you so much for giving us the platform. Thank you, Dr. Sayan. Thank you, all the faculty, Santamda, Dr. Santunu, Dr. Indranil, everyone. Uh, we had finished this course successfully. And regarding the residents, I feel that they will ultimately understand in, in future how important these classes were and they will go back and they'll watch it in YouTube. Because probably now they are thinking the clinical oncology is the most important thing to study, but slowly they will understand the importance of this course. So thanks all, whoever has uh, uh, participated, I thank everyone who has not participated. You can share this message to each and everyone in a later date, they can watch it on YouTube. So thanks, Sian, and thank all the faculties. We can conclude. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that's all for today. So good night and goodbye.